so I'm Joanne McNeil. I'm a, uh, currently a senior research officer with the uh, University of Western Sydney. Um, I also do work with the Centre for Social Impact at Swinburne in Melbourne and also with the University of Newcastle, part of the gig economy. Um, I will talk a little bit about a couple of things that have been mentioned in the uh, session previously for some of you who were here with a little bit more detail. And then I'm going to introduce, um, and I'll also introduce you to uh, some social procurement broad concepts. Um, but what we're going to learn from today mostly is the three wonderful case studies that we've got here. Um, and I'll be introducing each of the three fellows, and they are fellows in this case, <laughs> um, who will come up one by one and we'll talk about each of their um, enterprises and the work that they're doing around social procurement. And then they will take a seat on the comfy chairs up on the stage. And at the end, we'll have um, some facilitated Q&A. So keep track of those questions as we go through. Um, we've got quite a lot of content and it is really interesting stuff. Um, um, so we're not going to stop for questions in between the sessions, but we'll have some at the end. So uh, if you really feel the burning urge that you must leave in the middle of a session and go to somewhere else, um, the fellows will be around um, at least until the end of tomorrow. I think David needs to go tomorrow. Um, Andrew and Carlos are here for the duration. Yes. And so you can approach them as well um, in between times. But hopefully you might stick with us because we have constructed a session which kind of um, moves through some different dimensions of social procurement. Um, Hmm. I'll say that one at the end. Okay, so firstly, um, I just wanted to let you know that um, I have, as Sarah mentioned in the last session, a group called Social Procurement Australasia. Now, that's a collaboration of entities, um, government, non-government, and uh, some um, uh, for-profit entities, which uh, have been working together for quite a few years now to try and um, grow the social procurement space. Uh, I used to be the secretary for that and I still have some involvement and it's a terrific organisation. At the end I'll put up the contact details and various ways you can um, be across the communications there um, and I'd encourage you to check it out. It's a really useful resource as well as um, now starting to ramp up into some really quite detailed training that around this area which is um, proving to be very uh, popular amongst councils and things. So, um, so what are we talking about when we talk about social procurement? Um, it's the intentional generation of social value through procurement and commissioning processes. So it occurs when an organisation is buying a good or service or del delivering works and they choose to intentionally purchase a social outcome as part of that of what they're doing. Um, so it's above and beyond the services that you require. Um, so social procurement can take many forms and this is an area with lots of nuances and complexity so I'm giving you a really little um, sort of drop on this to get us started today. Um, the, two, the most um, important thing I think to get to your mind around at, the, at that broad level is the idea of direct and indirect social procurement. So direct social procurement is where you're actually purchasing from a for social purpose entity such as those that we're going to hear from and the ones that we heard in the last session for those who are with us. Um, who have as their core mission to achieve various types of social outcomes. Um, indirect social procurement is where you build social clauses and other ways of uh, generating social outcomes into sort of what I, I call regular contracts. So you might be building a road anyway. So let's try and bring some social outcomes into that as well. So those are probably just, just to keep that in your mind um, in terms of uh, how we can go about this. Those of us who are, uh, come from a background around social enterprise, which I certainly do, and um, social procurement, of course, are very keen on the, the direct social procurement because it helps to build capacity into the sector and it helps to grow the social outcomes in a way um, that is much more sustainable and long-lasting than you'll often get in the shorter-term um, sort of contract-embedded type form of social procurement. Um, very quickly, I'm just going to mention a project which Sarah touched on and which, um, which CRNA and Resource Recovery Australia are partners in and which I'm um, working with uh, Professor Joe Barraquet to project manage, which is the new project funded by the Office of Environment and Heritage in New South Wales, uh, which is looking at developing some measurement and indicators and measurements and dashboards, basically helping the community recycling enterprise sector in New South Wales to get uh, much more uh, tight about how 
they report on the outcomes that they're getting. So watch the space for that. That project's due um, for that first phase of the project is due to wrap up by the middle of the year. So um, there should be some really exciting things happening as a result of that after after that that research is done. Um, there is also a various um, consultation activities going on around that as well, which you could talk to either Sarah or myself about if you are interested in learning more about those afterwards. Um, so I'm going to introduce now, um, as I said, each of the um, um, Carlos, Andrew and David will come up. I'm not going to do bios on them. This conference is, has done an amazing job at all of its um, online stuff. So there's some really good bios and information on each of the, the um, actual people involved there if you want to know more about them or, of course, talk to them is always good. Um, but I'm going to ask Carlos Aguado from Endeavour Foundation to come up first, then Andrew Douglas from Soft Landing and finally David Kuhn from SS Rock. Um, in Sydney. And then at the end, if we're good and we keep to time, um, we'll have enough time to have a, a bit of a discussion about what we've heard from the enterprises. So I'll ask Carlos, please come up. There's your clicker. Thanks, Jill. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Carlos from Endeavour Foundation. I uh, hope you all found the coffee. Uh, I didn't. I paid $4 for it in the bar downstairs, but it was it was okay. It was pretty good. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to share with you uh, Endeavor Foundation's experience with social procurement today, and I promise I'll keep the time. Uh, so today uh, we'll cover just a brief intro on Endeavor Foundation as an organization, and then our experience with social uh, procurement. Uh, from a definition, from the spectrum of social procurement that we've experienced, uh, to what our relevant services are to social procurement and this conference, uh, as well as the benefits for government and the community, and finally a case study with a particular council. Uh, so a brief uh, background, Endeavor Foundation started in 1951, uh, where a couple of uh, school teachers told a couple of Queensland moms that uh, their subnormal children were unteachable, uh, that they could not be taught. Uh, these moms refused that notion, um, took their kids into a backyard, and uh, started teaching them in 1951. These then became the first special schools in Queensland, uh, which were then uh, taken over by the state government. Uh, today, uh, we continue to work along those same uh, principles. Uh, we provide all kinds of uh, services to people with a disability from direct employment, uh, to home and accommodation, uh, to uh, social and community participation, to learning, uh, as well as our relationships and independence teaching. Uh, overall, we provide support to about 4,000 uh, people with a disability throughout Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria. Uh, we also provide uh, a diverse range of business solutions. Uh, so from council recycling solutions, that is uh, operating transfer stations, your tip shops, your recycle markets, um, to confidential document, document destruction uh, and e-waste recycling. We also do a range of food packaging, pharmaceutical packaging, general packaging, uh, and we even um, produce uh, safety equipment uh, so that's your PPE, uh, to other timber products like steaks and pegs and the like. Uh, again, we're also present in Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria. So on to social procurement from how we've experienced it. Uh, this is a photo of one of, the, um, uh, one of the recycle markets that we operate on the Gold Coast. Um, just as Joe had defined it earlier, I guess the way we see social procurement, what is procurement? Procurement normally is, is starts out with a need for a service, Take it to procurement, procurement sources a supplier to deliver that service, and then finally there's a service outcome. Uh, the way we see it is simply that social outcomes are injected into the procurement process, ideally from the procurement process, not after the service has been delivered. Um, because if procurement involves the social outcome from the get-go, then um, uh, there are a high, there's a much higher chance that those social outcomes will be delivered in the way that they've been specified. Um, so we've experienced a almost like a spectrum of, of, of procurement, um, from social procurement as we know it, to procurement that doesn't involve any social outcomes at all. And that's okay too. Um, but today we're talking about the different kinds. So there's an, there was informal kinds of uh, procurement where pretty much it's, it's a government body, for example, going to say, could you give us a quote to uh, mow this lawn or to do this? And it's quite an informal arrangement. There is no formal request for tender and that kind of thing. Uh, then there's a formal arrangement. So that is usually by a tender or by a contract or a request for um, an expression of interest. Um, 
some of these formal uh, tenders don't have any link to social outcomes at all. So normally these are evaluation criteria such as price, um, experience, methodology, and um, referees. And then there are some that, that go on to say, okay, social outcomes uh, are optional. Please list them down. We may or may not consider them. We may or may not uh, add any kind of weighting to them. But please list them down if you can. And then we've experienced uh, those that had evaluation criteria for social outcomes. Again, not mandatory, but they're there. Then there are those that had social outcomes as part of the evaluation criteria. If you didn't include any social outcomes, uh, your, your submission wouldn't be considered. Um, and these are all examples of what Joe termed as indirect social procurement. And then finally, there's, there's I, th I think, the, the, the strictest form of social procurement at this stage, which is direct uh, social procurement, where, in fact, uh, just to be eligible to make that submission, you've got to be a registered social benefit supplier, a social enterprise. So you've got to be registered with the Australian Charities uh, Network. Um, it's worth mentioning at this stage that one of the councils that we deal with actually um, allocates a portion of their annual procurement spend for direct spend with social enterprises within their community. And we find that uh, that's, that's quite innovative uh, for, for councils to, to implement. Um, so what are the things that we do that, that often collide with um, social procurement in a good way? Uh, is oftentimes uh, the transfer stations that we operate, the tip shops and recycle markets. We also operate some material recovery facilities, and overall, this provides uh, employment of 200 uh, community locals, um, and uh, over 50 of them are people with a disability. Um, a lot of this, uh, a lot of the the, the social procurement uh, outcomes are quite uh, public facing. And that's another benefit that councils experience because um, there's, there's quite a lot of um, media that comes along with it. Just a quick example. Brisbane and the Gold Coast councils have upgraded their waste transfer stations to make it easier for householders to throw and go. And it means more of the good stuff can be salvaged for resale. Now they've taken out around uh, 1,200 tonnes of rubbish that otherwise would have ended up in landfill. The Endeavour Foundation runs Brisbane City Council tip shops at Geebung and Acacia Ridge. Their motto, low prices for a high turnaround. Golf clubs and kids' toys for one dollar, office furniture starting at five. You get constantly amazed by what turns up here. At the Reedy Creek tip shop on the Gold Coast you'll find recycled fare with a coastal flavour. Paddle boards for no more than $50, surf skis for around $60, and plenty of outdoor furniture and garden equipment ranging from $1 to $20. There's even an assortment of cheap air conditioners. The advice from thrifty shoppers is it's worthwhile travelling around, but be warned, tip shops are more popular than ever, so it's worthwhile checking out the opening times so you can be first through the door. It's hundreds of customers over the weekend, so it's really well patronised. So social procurement is often for services that are really quite public facing and can therefore yield quite a bit of um, media presence for the council and for the social enterprise. Um, we also find that it enables a triple bottom line uh, for the government, uh, for the buyer that is. So that's the economic, the social and the environmental. Um, and, and oftentimes we're, we're asked to report on these as well to help the buyer communicate to um, its constituents how much of a social outcome it is that they've generated through buying our services. So uh, lastly, a case study, that's Gold Coast City Council. Um, this is one of the, the uh, stations that we operate at Reedy Creek. Uh, it all started with a uh, request for tender, a very formal one, um, for the front end recycling and the recycle markets. Um, the tender was only open to not-for-profit, so you did have to be a registered charity. It was that very much that strict, direct social procurement. Um, and so just to be eligible for that, you had to be one of those. Um, they, they also uh, made it mandatory that as part of the submission, you had to note down exactly what social outcomes you were going to, provi going to provide to the local Gold Coast community. And then, in fact, once you've won it, you'd have to report on that quite regularly. So that's something we, we put a lot of effort into because uh, we need to make sure that we're achieving our performance. Um, so that, that was part of our KPIs, and it is on an ongoing basis, including reinvestment into the local community. 
uh, and, and we've been awarded two contracts on that um, particular setup. Um, so the social outcomes for, for uh, everybody involved, uh, local processing means local employment for the Gold Coast. And so it employs uh, 42 Gold Coast locals. Uh, about two-thirds of them are people with a disability who otherwise might find it difficult to find employment elsewhere. Uh, many more are actually rotated in the training process. So it's not just, uh, just two-thirds of the 42. Uh, those go through a lot of rotations as well. Uh, we engage with a lot of lo local special schools for a lot of work experience programs because a lot of them want to know what it's like to work uh, in the workplace without, uh, without um, the pressure of, of any kind of bullying or, or a safer environment, I suppose, to learn and work. And we do a lot of that uh, year-round. We also have a lot of uh, certificate outcomes, so uh, recognized certs in, in retail and warehousing, as well as forklift licenses. Um, there's a lot of improved communication, fine motor skills, basically transferable skills that these people with a disability can then take with them to their next gig. Uh, finally, about 5,500 tons uh, per annum is, is diverted. Um, and through all of this, council gets to achieve value for money, which is the most important thing. Uh, lastly, our supported employees, they really enjoy this because it provides them the dignity of work. It, it provides them uh, with, with on-the-job training, recognized qualifications, uh, a social and supportive working environment, uh, professional and personal development that they can look forward to every single day. Um, and, and just being alongside their mates um, is something that, that we sometimes take for granted, but they certainly don't. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. G'day. Um, my name's Andrew Douglas. I'm the National Manager for two organisations, Resource Recovery Australia and Soft Landing, uh, our parent social enterprise uh, community resources. We've lucky enough to have our CEO here today, John Wheat. So, g'day, John. Um, I'm wearing my soft landing hat today, so I'll be talking about social procurement in the lens of mattress recycling. Uh, a bit of the history of soft landing and our social enterprise. We fell into it uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, at the time, we were working with Mission Australia. We had some op shops in the Illawarra. Uh, we had a small illegal dumping problem around our bins. But in 2009, our incidence of illegally dumped mattresses skyrocketed. It went through the roof. We went from one or two a month to about seven or eight a week. Uh, and I was trying to find what the driver was. So I called up the local landfill and they said, uh, council have brought in some new rates. Uh, one of the rates is mattresses, they're now $20 per piece. Uh, E-waste, tyres, they're all additional charges. So the lovely residents of the Illawarra would get to the landfill, uh, they'd go over the Weybridge and the guy at the Weybridge would go, $20 for your trail of rubbish and an extra $20 for your mattress and another 20 for your TV. So they'd do a U-turn and go and find one of our charity bins and donate their 20 year old mattress to us. So we had this big mattress problem exploded overnight. Uh, we had lots of volunteers who were sorting clothes but looking for paid work. And we had the proposition to them if uh, you can cut these mattresses cheaper than uh, what I'm going to pay to landfill them, I'll employ you and we'll save a little bit of money. So the guys pulled them apart. We knew nothing about mattresses. Apparently, you can pull them apart with the Stanley knife in about five minutes. Uh, it took a lot longer than that when the guys first started. They're very proficient now. Back in the early days, it took a long time. So we loaded all the rubbish, which it was, mattress material, back onto the truck, went back to the landfill and said, um, the mattresses are gone, we've just got some uh, residual waste here. And the guy at the Weybridge is going, I don't think so, mate, that's a mattress. Go, no, no, that's textile, that's spring, that's foam. So he's going through his flip chart and ringing up the admin block and they're trying to get the waste manager down to you know, stop this charity, try and bring waste over the bridge. Uh, but technically we had them, so they said, look, fair enough, fair cop, um, you know, these, these constituent components can come over the bridge without a fee. And, um, you know, the volumes kept increasing, we gave our guys more work, but the tip were pretty unhappy. And they said, look, talk to one steel, they've got the steel contract here, mattresses are a pain in the neck for them, uh, see if a conversation can start there. So we, we said, look, we'll take the mattresses, we'll give our guys work, um, will you guys pay us to take the mattresses away? And that's how we got into mattress recycling. Um, it was that proposition that uh, it was 
as good an outcome keeping them out of landfill but in, uh, providing employment and an environmental outcome than it was the status quo. Uh, mattresses are a big problem in landfill. They're bulky, they're difficult to compact. Uh, if you're drilling for gas, they r wind up around the drill head, uh, they'll wind up around your excavator. Um, so there was a, a need in the community for a service to get rid of these things out of landfill. Uh, the guys that we were looking to target, it's a rough and tumble job. You know, you, you're in there uh, manually pulling apart these things. It's, it's a bit of uh, grunt required. And for guys that um, uh, either not worked or not, uh, have never worked or have been long-term unemployed or don't have the transferable skills to get in the open labour market, uh, it's a good job. If you're having a bad day, you can take it out of the mattress, your productivity increases, and that's good for me. Uh, the guys that we put on, and they typically are gentlemen, um, present with multiple uh, barriers to the open labour market, and whether that's through uh, poor health, disabilities, low literacy and numeracy levels, Aboriginality, uh, they generally present with multiple barriers that we address on our journey, and that's through training, mentorship, and a pay packet. Uh, from two guys that were cutting five mattresses a week, we're now uh, a national organisation. We're the biggest mattress recycler in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, we've got sites all over the country and our expansion plans are significant. But me up here sprouting off about how good we are is only half the story. So we engaged the University of New South Wales and Social Ventures Australia to do an independent evaluation about what's the hidden value of what we're doing. So if they could put financial proxies on things like um, getting people off benefits and be, you know, giving them a pay packet and let them contribute as a taxpayer, where's the financial value there? And if the guys are working and they're not down at the bus stop kicking in the glass and the local government aren't having to go and pick up the mess and clear up graffiti, what's that worth? And if the family unit isn't breaking down and there's not instances of homelessness and domestic violence, What's that worth? And if these guys aren't going to the pub on the Friday night, getting in a fight and end up down the police station, what's that worth? So we aggravated, we aggravated, we <laughs> aggregated all of these values um, and we came with a, a $3.60 return for every dollar invested by a customer who are predominantly local government. The other customers that we have, um, and increasingly the space, and anyone who's in Janelle's session, um, we're tending towards uh, extended producer res responsibility where the manufacturers and retailers are saying, this is our problem, um, we want to address it ourselves. And we're in the fortunate position where they've procured our service to say, you guys are the largest manufacturer, we love the model, we like the social side, we love the environmental, can you run the scheme for us? And as far as I'm aware of, there's nowhere in the world that's uh, tried to tackle this kind of um, problem using a, a social enterprise as a vehicle to look at uh, post-consumer waste. And the brands and the players that we're dealing with are significant and um, they've got a lot of skin in the game. We've also had to look, look at what our social procuring customers want and they don't just want the guys to pick up a mattress and cut the mattress, they want to look at the whole life cycle of the mattress and make sure that we can pull all those components apart and get to 100% diversion from landfill. So we've had to reverse think how we treat a mattress coming from the consumer and once it's in the waste stream, how do we maximise the value that we get out of those materials? So rather than trying to intercept mattresses at the landfill or the tip face, we're going back up the stream so we can get them from the resident. And if we can get them from the resident at the time of swap out, a new mattress goes in, when you buy one, the old one comes out, they're not left in the rain, animals aren't doing their dirty business on them, they are not in, uh, infested with rodents, means we can maximise our material recovery. The customers want us to be competitive and for us to be a viable business we, we need to be competitive. So uh, we're looking over the horizon, we're talking to mattress manufacturers about their engineering componentry in the next 10 years. So. Uh, what are they putting in the mattress now that we're going to have to deal with in 10, 15 years' time at the end of that life? Uh, 
10 years ago when I started first pulling mattresses apart, I never thought I'd be on a journey where I was looking at polyurethane foam and the polypropylene and the different um, compositions of these materials, but now it's a journey I'm very invested in because the more that I understand, the better I can uh, make connections to keep those resources out of the ground. Uh, we've partnered with the University of New South Wales. Uh, they've looked at all of our um, waste streams. They've done a material analysis at all the textiles, all the components of the mattress. They're now start, starting to make new compounded materials that will be fit for uh, acoustic walling, um, carpet underlay, uh, and products that we haven't even thought of yet. So it's a really exciting journey that we're on and we're bringing our customers on that journey. Um, I've just got a quick video uh, about the social procurement that we took with IKEA. In 2013, uh, they put a waste tender out to um, the market. We thought we could help them with their mattress problem. Uh, I remember going to the room and there was uh, Vizzy, Ramondas, Suez, and I'm there with my Mission Australia t-shirt on and they were all looking at me going, I think you're in the wrong room, mate. And I, oh, no, we just want to talk about mattresses. Um, and it was a, a pre-tender uh, briefing and you know, there's lots of waste jargon that I was unfamiliar with. Um, but I, I got talking to the, the uh, sustainability manager and he, he was really invested in what I had to say about uh, using the waste that they were creating to you know, to, uh, change, keep out of landfill and create wages for our guys. And he was uh, quite... Um, intrigued about how that process might work. So he encouraged me to, to put a tender in and, and we won. We won the uh, national contract for IKEA at uh, a very commercial price. And he wanted to know, after we won the tender, you know, how come you're charging me so much? I said, oh, no, no, that's a commercial price because uh, the productivity that our guys have isn't the same as uh, the main street. The, They've got to develop, they've got to build their work muscle, they're coming from uh, different levels of disadvantage. So we need to put more supervision and we need to put more wraparound support. He said, that's perfect, we're more than happy to invest in uh, a business that does that. So I'll just uh, play this with a bit of uh, background there. Soft landing ultimately through Resource Recovery Australia. We are a social enterprise under a non-profit organisation and we're all about job creation. A social enterprise is a business that's driven by a social, economic, cultural and environmental mission consistent with public benefits. So we bring in about 350 mattresses per site per day. From there, we break them down to get all the recyclable material. So we take the foam out, the timber out and the metal out and we recycle all those components. Each of those help create more jobs and pathways to employment for people who would normally not get a chance. We've got a waste wages agenda. For us, it's about bringing most uh, disadvantaged people in our community, give them meaningful employment, train them up, and then use that as a springboard for them to enter the open labour market. These guys are pretty much about giving people second chances, so they let me come in, prove myself, and have given me opportunities to better my life. I probably wouldn't have got those chances anywhere else. In providing a platform for social change, you know, partnerships like the one with IKEA and Soft Landing is hugely important. We want to align our business to have a positive impact on both people and the planet. And hopefully by communicating that to other businesses, they can see the benefit as well of working with a social enterprise like Soft Landing. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is David Kuhn. I'm with uh, Southern Sydney Regional Organization of Councils. And I uh, just wanted to, um, some of you may have seen these slides before. We're going to um, recycle these slides a little bit. Uh, if you heard uh, Sarah Ch Chisholm's uh, presentation in the last session. Um, uh, but um, this story is really, it is not a social procurement story. This is a story about uh, enabling the social and community sector uh, in waste and recycling um, to, um, to, well, really to, even the playing field, give, give them a platform uh, with local government, um, and, uh, and there were a couple of reasons why we did it. Uh, the present presentation um, will kind of run you through our thinking um, through our regional waste strategy, which had um, quite a, um, we start, so we started from reuse. But a quick background, um, tiny area in Sydney, 
uh, southern Sydney, that, there's Botany Bay there in the middle, 11 councils now um, with amalgamations, uh, 1.6 million people, so very tightly packed, uh, very dense, hard to scratch out any space to do any r real facilities work or um, new infrastructure. Um, very highly dense, 50% um, uh, medium and high density, and uh, it continues, continues to grow. Uh, we have uh, a, a seven-year regional action plan, a uh, regional waste strategy, excuse me, and um, we're just about to review and update our action plan. So my role and my, I have two uh, counterparts um, on sort of a waste team, a waste coordination role. We do coordination, planning, procurement for local government and advocacy. So um, we uh, want to, we, from the beginning in our waste strategy, we had it in there to push uh, residents, um, industry, and uh, governments uh, up the, the waste hierarchy. So we wanted to be working more in reuse and, and uh, reuse, uh, resource recovery. And uh, that was embedded in our waste strategy from day one. Um, there are W2, which is, is just our own internal coding, but um, we, from the beginning, have been looking at uh, sub-regional reuse business models. Uh, and um, so high U, high I, we did a, an urgency and importance spectrum for all of our actions, and this one ranked high, so it was a high priority for us. Uh, in, I inserted this slide um, because um, uh, for a range of reasons, we wanted to um, understand what the cleanup service was. So that's the bulky, the bulky waste cleanup service. That's furniture on the curb uh, and um, uh, reusable and non-reusable, of course. Uh, and we wanted to um, bring down tonnages. Councils, our councils want to bring down tonnages, increase resource recovery, and we wanted to bring up uh, the capacity to, to recover those resources. And, um, and, and to do that, we knew we had to work with residents a little closer. Um, not all councils are at the same uh, readiness level, and so SS Rock's role in this regard is to uh, assist councils and, and, and uh, enable those drivers. We did a few different pieces of research. Uh, in 2014, we did a cleanup audit. Uh, this was 12 councils at the time, um, uh, and we were measuring um, composition, weight, height, of the piles <clears throat> and calorific value. Um, we, the, the idea was um, creating the most potential uh, that was um, empirical and data-backed for re um, increased reuse and recycling um, per household. So the major material types were segregated into five categories. Um, we had a, a, a minimum number of samples per council. Um, this went over two different uh, cleanup cycles at the time. Um, so we were able to get 150 um, per council, uh, council area at the time. That was, was a nice large sample for us. We have a real diversity, real variation of services in our region. Um, not one is uh, the same as the other, literally. Uh, so um, we had to uh, understand that uh, and, and it was a big logistics work uh, for, the, for the auditor. But um, it, we, we segre segregated all of our uh, materials by the type of service that it was, that was, it was called on, so that's scheduled or on call, um, and uh, different size limits and different, um, some councils had four a year, some had two, some had 52 a year, so um, it was a real, um, a real analysis, a real rich in analysis for us, so, and also muds and suds. Um, this slide uh, and bar chart sort of uh, really cuts through, gave us some good understanding of what we were talking about, really demystifying for us what was on the curb. Uh, so uh, furniture um, ranks highly in reuse, so up to 50% there. Um, organics, of course, garden organics mostly in um, recyclable. Uh, furniture, of course, again in landfill only. Um, uh, so a lot of, we, a lot of MDF type furniture. Uh, goes through the curbside, um, and uh, a lot of e-waste in the problematic. So we, we're starting to see some, some real areas where we can do some work. In 2015, we did another piece of social research um, about the community attitudes to reuse. Um, the, um, th mostly through focus groups and surveys, we un uh, un segregated our 
participants by four reuser types. So there were the physical reusers, those, those who like to go into shops and, and touch things and you know, sort of tactile based. Uh, and they, they are buyers in, in, and they're also donators. Um, we had family and friend uh, who don't necessarily uh, go or frequent to um, uh, the retailing side of uh, reuse, uh, but they're happy to donate to friends and family uh, in need. Um, there were online reusers, which is the fastest growing, uh, and, and because of the, the number of platforms that are, are out there, um, they are sort of the most energetic um, reuser type, and then 13% no, uh, non-reusers. Uh, so yes, online reusers are where we, we know we need to be, um, in addition to the drop-off centers and sort of the, uh, address, addressing physical reuse um, constituencies. 66% uh, of, of respondents felt councils should take a major role in opportunities, and they, there was a little bit in the, in the study about what those roles they thought uh, councils should take. Some of it was in procurement. Um, Drop-off facilities were most preferred. Uh, swap meets and markets, um, these are sort of a boot sale type markets or, or um, sort of uh, side of the road, um, spontaneous markets were least preferred. Um, willingness to travel was interesting for us. Uh, so 69% uh, said that they would travel less than three kilometers from their home. Um, now, some of you who live in inner Sydney know that uh, it's, it can take you an hour to get three kilometers. So at least that was something for us, but it does drop off there. So 51% did say that they um, would only go about five kilometers and then 22% uh, would about 10, 10 kilometers. Uh, last year, we um, took all of that data and we decided to go uh, into market to um, request um, some reuse solutions. So um, what, we, what we were looking for were um, online and infrastructure uh, type solutions to, to meet our council's reuse needs. Um, we were using language like we want to mainstream reuse, we want to decouple the, the waste label from good quality items. We wanted to understand these um, market solutions for collection, segregation, processing, storage, workshops, training, education, resell, and, uh, and, and the technologies to employ those. We, wanted, we didn't want 100 trucks crisscrossing the region. Uh, that was important to us, um, so we, we, we made that clear. Um, but you know, collections and, and, and a place to sort of you know, triage this stuff. Um, and we want to enable residents. So what were, what were these um, the market suppliers able to do in terms of education, repair, uh, refurbishment, um, and their own sort of purchasing behaviors? So we had a few issues arising uh, in terms of, um, uh, well, I should say, the question uh, typically is, well, why didn't you go down that one of those paths? Um, we were quite happy with the responses that came through. Um, the main one was cash and time. Uh, we, we had a, a, a part in the RFI that was asking um, for an indication of scale, uh, an indication of how much money that they would need to sort of work at the capacity that we were asking. We didn't ask for budgets and, and, and breakdowns, but um, what, we, what we knew that, uh, was that we didn't have um, the money that was really required to scale uh, fair fairly f uh, for them. And we are also going through amalgamations in our region. And um, frankly, it was, uh, it's, it's, it's a tough time for councils to be thinking um, about a new untested facility or, or approach. It was difficult for us as a regional body to go out hat in hand to councils. Uh, so um, uh, so we, were, we were apprehensive. But the idea here is to share what these market, market uh, uh, solutions had to offer uh, with councils, and, and we've been able to do that. Uh, time was the other thing. That was back when we had some money to spend on a, on a 30th June deadline. Um, so uh, the, other, uh, the other issue that I'll just mention quickly is that you know, um, it was, we didn't have great consensus with our councils about what outcomes we really wanted. Did we want the highest possible avoidance and reuse outcome, or did we want the most resource recovery we could get where, where reuse was sort of cherry on, on top? And so um, you know, we, we've had lots of conversations about that, uh, but um, we, 
we, I, I think if you're working in a regional capacity, it's good to sort of try to get as much consensus about what you actually want before you go down that path. Uh, you may have seen this slide earlier. Uh, so what does uh, local government want? Um, uh, first and foremost, it wants to meet its resource recovery targets uh, and diversion targets. Um, it wants to reduce tonnages, misuse, and reliance on the cleanup service uh, and uh, reduce illegal dumping. Uh, it wants improved access to enterprises and technology solutions. Uh, so um, that's what these conferences and, and other uh, market solutions are about. Uh, uh, but um, uh, for us, we, want, we do want to work with, uh, uh, work with councils and, and breaking them out of sort of old thinking uh, and, and to get to where the technologies are. Um, credible pool of suppliers for service provision. Um, that involves trust and quality control and work health safety and all of that. Uh, reliable data and measurement tools um, for diversion. And uh, of course they want training and professional development services and they want responsible citizens. Who doesn't want that? So we've taken all of that information and we have, uh, we, we, we pulled it into um, uh, sort of a, uh, we took the brains trust on this project and we did, we turned it into, well, if we can't do something in, in the infrastructure uh, capacity, uh, can we enable uh, a network uh, of, uh, of some in, uh, industry network out there, you know, and who is out there? And we knew the Community Recycling Network of Australia was there, um, and we engaged them to uh, come up to Sydney and uh, talk about um, uh, really the central questions were, if you were to work in Sydney and, and target some of your um, advocacy services and technical um, support services, um, what would you like from your, uh, from your community recycling enterprises? And what would the enterprises in turn like from a, a central body? Um, so we held that forum. It was, it was great, uh, really good energy in the room. We brought local government in the room in the second half of the day uh, to uh, get the enterprises themselves who had just gone through a large um, SWOT analysis and uh, sort of obstacles, tabling the barriers that they have to getting work with local government, uh, turning those into opportunities and, and uh, for a network. And uh, we brought local government in to, to really um, sit for an interview with that enterprise. The enterprise sat with them individually and said, what, you know, what are your barriers to uh, procuring socially? And uh, it was a very productive uh, session. Uh, there's a write-up on it, and I'm happy to, to share. Um, but what we came up with, uh, and in uh, in agreement, really, uh, was that yes, enterprises do want a central body, and our top priorities are um, we need advocacy, we need coordina uh, coordinated access to markets, um, we need facilitated collaboration, we needed to address the barriers to, to capital, and we need to grow uh, markets for ourselves, for for our products and services. So this, the investigation of this network uh, is, has begun and, and from that forum. And um, as Sarah mentioned, we're working on a, a business plan now. Um, we're working across the different uh, regional organizations of councils. So it's a fairly big area. Um, and this is, this is the purpose for that network. So almost 4 million people. Um, so there's a, there's a number of benefits for local government. Um, I'll just focus on the top four. Um, we need a, um, for, from our perspective, we needed a larger and, and credible quality assured pool of supplier services in, in the waste industry. Uh, and um, not for councils not to consider the same uh, suppliers uh, and to, to, to uh, with, a, with a wider pool and more trust, you'll have a better, a better opportunity to collaborate. Um, and possibly with different outcomes than you're used to. Um, a central agent for driving collaboration uh, was, was important, and that's, that's something that local government will always keep, keep an eye on. Uh, and um, uh, access for enterprises to local government is a barrier in the past. This will assist. Uh, technical rigor on impact measurement. So as Sarah mentioned earlier, there's, they're working on an impact measurement tool, which will really uh, assist enterprises with digging down into what impacts their, their services uh, have. Um, those can be um, uh, used uh, in their own uh, rationalization of their services and operations, but also will be a great story for 
local government and, and the EPA. And that will, um, that will help quant all quantification is, uh, that's the sort of language that we're speaking here, so tons and dollars. This is a sampling of the, the network members in Sydney. Um, there are, tw was it 27? 27? Oh, nine in Sydney, yeah. That's right, yes. It was 66 sites, I believe. Yeah, right. So um, uh, the, these is, this is a list of the member services that are um, at this point draft, but um, they've been put, being put through some rigor testing with a technical advisory group. Um, so again, so it, 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 you can see it reflects what, um, what the, the outcomes um, that the enterprises themselves said they needed. Uh, this is uh, some, some mapping of the enterprises themselves. Uh, lots of tons there, um, lots of jobs, and, uh, and you know, seek, seeking to grow. Um, so this, this is the, I think, last slide, and we've got uh, uh, sort of an 18-month action plan, activity plan here. Um, and uh, we're, as Sarah said, we're looking to launch um, uh, in a sort of a dual arrangement with the Waste to Wages uh, Forum, which is an the CRNA uh, annual forum, uh, and um, we'll couple that with the launch of the CRN Sydney network. And this is uh, so, so second to last. Uh, so the uh, our our role here again, of course, is is um, oversight and, uh, of the KPIs and review of the business plan. And we've been able to bring in other state uh, and um, social enterprise stakeholders. Um, we will assist with the launch and um, kind of be with them every step of the way. We really want uh, this thing to be proven to be viable from day one. And um, with social procurement, um, we will continue to to provide trainings for for our councils. Um, Last year we did a, a workshop that was specifically sector facing uh, that was all about um, you know uh, how do you, how do you um, get work with local government and we'll continue to procure regionally so um, thanks for your time sorry I've gone over and uh, happy to be uh, t I'll be here for until the end of tomorrow thanks. <laughs>